Hey everyone, it's Rip Pro. Now we all know that in the 80s, video games did really well, then not really well, then really well again. This is the video game crash of 1983. And this is why the gaming environment looked completely different at the beginning and end of the decade. In much different ways than how gaming changes today. For now, let's look back at the decade of the 70s. This was essentially the wild west of video games. There were no standards about how video games should work and the technology was very primitive. What is generally referred to as the first video game console is the Magnavox Odyssey. And calling that thing a console to begin with is kind of generous. There were no graphics to speak of, and you would put overlays on the screen to simulate games like tennis or hockey. While we might look back on this today as primitive, for the early 70s, having a system in your home on your TV that could play multiple games was revolutionary. But home console video games really started to hit their stride with Atari. Founded in 1972 by Nolan Bushnell, Atari became a sensation with the release of Pong, and their hit console, the Atari VCS, also known as the Atari 2600. This is kind of irrelevant, but I found it funny that Nolan Bushnell actually had a couple of employees under him by the names of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, who approached him about investing in their Apple computer. They offered him a one-third share of the company for 50 grand. Apple is currently valued at 2.2 trillion dollars. So had he made and kept that investment, he would be worth over 733 billion dollars. When asked about this investment opportunity, Bushnell said, I was so smart. I said no. It's kind of fun to think about that when I'm not crying. But anyway, back to Atari. Atari was on top of the world and was expanding like crazy. But with success comes imitators. Eventually the market became oversaturated with a bunch of consoles trying to get in on the craze. The Atari 2600 started blending into the crowd with consoles like the Fairchild Channel F, the Astrocade, the Magnavox Odyssey 2, the Intellivision, the ColecoVision, the Vectrex, the RCA Studio 2, and the 1292 Advanced Programmable Video System, and a slew of others. Wow, I'm sure glad that console names have gotten simpler. However, something to distinguish consoles was their exclusive libraries. But only to a point. The exclusives weren't like they are today, where Nintendo has Mario, Sony has God of War, and Microsoft has Halo. The consoles had virtually the same games, just made by different people. Pretty much every console had a baseball game, a football game, and a version of Nintendo's Donkey Kong. And all of these console manufacturers were overzealous with the recent boom of video game popularity and vastly overproduced their console. To the point where some manufacturers were only moving about half of their inventory. Now we get to the meat and potatoes. Activision. This company is a lot different than the company we know and love today. In the 70s, there really weren't any third-party game developers. All the games were made by the console manufacturer. But when some employees at Atari were upset that they received no credit for the games that they were working on, they left and formed a new company with the knowledge of how the Atari works. Since all Atari games are made by Atari, there really wasn't a licensing system to release games on the platform like there is today. Atari didn't like another company releasing stuff on their platform, so they sued Activision to prevent their games from being sold. However, they ultimately settled with Activision, which allowed Activision to continue selling games for Atari. But Activision had to pay Atari royalties. But the thing is, there is still no licensing system. And with Activision basically getting away with releasing unapproved games on Atari, this opened the floodgates. While Activision still held their games to a standard of quality, a ton of third parties basically just released a bunch of crap games onto the Atari. This and the market saturation led to a ton of people losing confidence in the video game industry. I should note, however, this really only affected consoles. Arcades and computer games were pretty much unaffected. But this brings us to what I would refer to as the martyr. Howard Scott Warshaw was one of the most celebrated developers at Atari during its height. He was responsible for many of the Atari classics such as Yars Revenge or Raiders of the Lost Ark. This made him the perfect candidate to develop the highly anticipated movie tie-in, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Now I will say, this was not Warshaw's fault. He was put in a terrible situation that had no good ending. While games back then didn't take as much time to develop as they do now, they still took time. But the higher-ups at Warner, which um, was the company that owned Atari at the time, and the licensor Universal weren't really aware of this fact. By the time the deal was made, Warshaw only had five weeks to make this game to meet the holiday deadline. With how big the deal was, 
and the fact that it was tying into a critically acclaimed blockbuster hit. This was hyped as not just the next big step for Atari, but for video games in general. So when the game released in December of 1982, the game sold like hotcakes. But when kids got the game and tried playing it, they were confused. Now, looking back at the game with a critical eye in 2023, it's not horrible. But it was nearly impossible to play without a ton of background info or a guide. But for how much time Warshaw had to work on it, it was impressive for what it was. But most other Atari games, like Asteroids, made it very clear from the first screen what your objective was. This game was essentially open world and involved a player exploring a six screen cube. And don't even get me started on the holes. It was very easy to fall into them and very difficult to get out. But even though the game sold incredibly, there were tons of returns, far more than Atari could have ever anticipated. The fallout from this was possibly the last nail in the coffin for what we um, see as this generation of Atari. The CEO stepped down and Atari was forced to reorganize. It is very important to note though, this is not what caused the crash, but it sure didn't help. The crash at this point was kind of an inevitability, it was going to happen regardless, this is kind of sped it up. An overhyped game that was released by a developer people could generally rely upon was definitely not a good thing. There's actually a long-standing theory that all of the um, unsold and returned cartridges for the E.T. video game were buried in a landfill in New Mexico. There's a very interesting documentary on this called Atari Game Over that I believe you can find on Amazon Prime. It's definitely worth giving a watch. They go way more in depth about all this and actually include an excavation of the landfill in question. However, back to the video game crash. This festered in the West for two years but didn't really affect Japan. Over there, the market was ruled by Nintendo, um, the company that developed the previously mentioned Donkey Kong arcade game. Their Famicom, or Family Computer, was doing really well in Japan and decided to modify it for a Western release. Some of the big changes is that they removed the microphone and they made the controllers detachable. Unlike the Famicom, this new console, the Nintendo Entertainment System, also had standardized game packs. This name for the cartridges um, was actually part of Nintendo's overall marketing strategy to um, sell video games in a market that's given up on video games. They wanted to make it very clear this wasn't a video game console, it was a toy. Hence the games it came bundled with were Gyromite and Duck Hunt, both of which used a toy-like peripheral to play the game. These very famously being the NES Zapper and Rob the Robot. Once consumer trust returned to the market, Gyromite and Rob were removed as bundles, and Super Mario Bros. was added. With console games coming back into um, predominance, manufacturers did not want to make the same mistakes that previous manufacturers had made. Starting with the NES, it became standard practice for the console to validate the game that um, it's trying to play to make sure that it's a properly licensed copy. This allowed Nintendo to have much more control over what goes on their system. But now that the video game market's back on its feet, where's Atari? After reorganizing, Atari was still determined to have a presence in the video game industry, even if most of those efforts were in vain. They came out with a few more consoles, like the Atari 5200, the Atari 7800, and their own handheld to compete with the um, Nintendo Game Boy, the Atari Lynx. None of these did very well, but in the mid-1990s they made one last infamous attempt, the Atari Jaguar. This console is famous for bragging about being the first 64-bit console, but was really just laughed off as a joke. In reality, the Jaguar was running off of two 32-bit um, processors rather than one 64-bit processor. For those that don't know, this means that the Jaguar was, in practice, a 32-bit system. It didn't have the same capabilities as actual 64-bit systems like the Nintendo 64. Atari ended up getting bought and sold a few times before ending up in the hands of the video game company Infogrames. Yes, Infogrames, not Infogames. It sounds weird to me, too. But they um, ended up renaming themselves to Atari, and they've been floundering ever since. So thank you very much for listening to my nerdy lecture. This is a topic that I'm very passionate about, and I hope you all learned something. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.